If you've learned about the equations of the circle, the ellipse, the parabola and the hyperbola, you might well have heard your teacher refer to these as the conic sections. If you queried that terminology, your teacher should have explained that we picture a cone being cut by a sloping plane. The slope of the plane can vary from shallow to steep. In that case we get various kinds of cross-section with the cone. And these cross-sections turn out to be the circle, the ellipse, the parabola or the hyperbola. The Wikipedia website has made some nice pictures of this, so I've imported some of them here. The web address is at the bottom, but I'm afraid you can't click on it. If you want to look at it, you'd have to type it out. It is a well worth looking at this site, though. There's lots of nice explanation. Let's focus on diagram 2 to begin with and look at the lower cone. It's being cut by a plane that's flat, horizontal. The cut certainly appears to be a circle. Of course, looking like a circle doesn't mean to say that it is. We would need to prove that. Now imagine taking that plane and tilting it a little. Wikipedia have actually done that on the upper cone, just for clarity. We could have done it on the lower cone, but it would have interfered with the circular diagram. On the upper cone we can see that the tilt appears to stretch the circular cross-section out so that it's longer one way than the other. It's certainly a reasonable assumption that that might be an ellipse, but again we would have to prove it. Now imagine tilting the plane more. Eventually it will reach a critical moment when the slope of the plane is exactly equal to the gradient of the sloping side of the cone. At this point we're now in diagram 1. The plane still only cuts one of the cones. It can't possibly cut the other. But the cut is now a parabola. Finally, if we tilt further and make a very steep plane, then it will cut both of the cones and we're in diagram 3. The cross sections are now the, the opposing curves that you see here in the top and bottom cone. It turns out these are the two branches of an hyperbola. Wikipedia has put all these pictures together in a single diagram. It's quite nice as well, so I've shown it in the next slide. Here you can clearly see how the plane of the cross-section changes, getting larger as we go from circle through ellipse, eventually to parabola, and then when very steep, to the hyperbola. Our job now is going to show that these really are the curves that we get for the cross-sections. Most of the proof of this will appear in part two of the presentation. For the moment, I want to look in more detail at the equations of the cone and the plane. I will assume that you're a little bit familiar with these materials, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. Let's write down first of all the equation for a circular cone with tip at the origin. Here's the equation z squared equals alpha squared times x squared plus y squared. This actually gives us a pair of cones as shown in the Wikipedia diagrams, tip to tip with the tips at the origin. The cones are circular. Actually, that's sort of preempting our first result, which is that the horizontal cross sections are circular. Let's see how all this works by actually investigating the cross sections now. Let's start with a vertical cross section. We'll take y equals 0, for example. If we set y equals 0 in the cone equation, we get z squared equals alpha squared x squared. Taking square roots both sides gives z equals alpha x or negative alpha x. That's a pair of straight lines with slope alpha or negative alpha. Let's do a sketch of that. Without any loss of generality, we can assume that alpha is positive. So we get the two straight lines shown here with the corresponding slopes. These straight lines, of course, constitute the outline of the sloping sides of the cone. We could just as well look at a vertical cross-section with, say, x equals 0. The picture will be exactly the same, except that it will be plotted with z against y now. Actually, these vertical cross-sections will look the same whatever orientation we take for the vertically cutting plane. They will always look like a pair of straight lines, because the cone is circular. It's symmetric all the way round. 
To see that in detail, we would need to look at the horizontal cross sections. Let's do that next. For horizontal cross section, we set z equal to a constant and substitute that into the cone equation. For example, just take z equals, say, c. Then we get c squared equals alpha squared x squared plus y squared. And if we divide by alpha squared, then x squared plus y squared equals c squared over alpha squared. These are circles with radius c over alpha. OK, so then we can put all that together and to draw the cone the easiest thing is to draw some three-dimensional axes put on a vertical cross-section like so let's label the axes x, y and z and then because the cone has horizontal cross-sections that are circles, we can give the whole thing a three-dimensional look by making the cross-sections look like circles. And there's our pair of cones, tip to tip at the origin. OK, so much for the cone. We've got the equation. We now need to write down the equation of a plane. In three dimensions, the equation of a plane has the form ax plus by plus cz equals d. We could rearrange that. Let's assume c is not zero. So then z is d minus ax minus by divided by c. In principle, we need to solve this equation simultaneously with the cone equation. z squared equals alpha squared x squared plus y squared. I'm sure you can see that substituting this z into the left-hand side is going to make a rather messy expression. It will actually be quite complicated to unravel. We'd like to avoid doing that if we possibly can. Well, in this particular situation, we can avoid doing that, we can simplify the equation of the plane. The point is that the cone is circular. Since the cone is circular, once we've got a sloping plane cutting it, we can rotate that plane about the origin without changing the overall effect of the cross sections. That means that we can choose a particular plane that has a simpler equation. For example, we can choose a plane that misses one of the axes. If you find that hard to picture, have a look at the plot that I've done with Mathematica. To get this plot, I had to actually choose some numbers. and I've chosen here z equals 2y plus 5. This is a sloping plane, and you can see that it misses the x-axis completely. However, it's just as good as any other plane that might cut the axis. For that reason, instead of using the full plane equation, we cut our cone with a plane that simply relates z to y, leaving out x. I don't want to choose particular numbers, so 2 and 5 will change, and I'm going to use z equals ay plus b where a and b are constants. Such a plane will look like the one I've got pictured here, though the precise slope will depend on the relative values of a and b, and the places where the plane cuts the z and the y-axis, of course, will also depend on those values. OK, so finally, the situation I'm going to solve when I move on to part two of this presentation is the following. z squared equals alpha squared x squared plus y squared, that's the cone, and at the same time z equals ay plus b. That is a very particular plane, but from the point of view of the cone, it's just as good as any other plane. 
it will tell us all we need to know about the cross-sections in entire generality. I'm going to conclude part one here and we'll move on and talk about the solutions of these equations in part two.